I've been playing a lot of Disco Elysium recently, which happens to be marked by my transition from simping for Kim to screwing with him because it's funny. Really, it's a good way to humorously contrast the depressing environment of the game. I think the devs nailed their ability to show you pornographically poor and run-down cities while every now and then giving you something to laugh at so it's not too mentally taxing. Before we continue, two content warnings. One, I'm going to be talking about depression. Duh. And two, this video has Disco Elysium spoilers, so if you need to avoid either or both of those, I suggest watching one of my other videos. Perhaps the one where I talk about Vaporwave for 30 minutes? Anyways, Disco Elysium is a point-and-click CRPG where you play as Harry Dubois, a man whose past is so distressing that his resulting drinking problem made him lose all memory of who he is, including the fact that he's a detective assigned to a murder case in the city of Revachal. The game has a great balance of depressingly realistic scenes and comedic relief, however, once you've been crazy enough to accept inframaterialism, apologize ten times, recruit Kim into your precinct, and go hardcore, that humorous layer begins to fade away since your focus starts to shift towards bits of game content you didn't get in previous playthroughs. I mention this because Disco Elysium made me realize something about how my depression works these days. It's worth noting that for a lot of people, Disco Elysium seems to help with their depression. When you're playing as someone whose life has gone to shit and is having a hard time recovering from their mistakes, you want to see them get better. You do what you can to make them happy. Suddenly, it dawns on you that, hey, if someone was playing me as a video game character, they'd feel pretty bad and would want me to get better too, just like Harry here. The game gets you to think about your life in the third person, which, in my opinion, is a great tool for helping someone conceptualize their depression in a way that motivates them to get better. All that said, the game did not have this effect on me, and it's because of what stage of depression I'm in. For lack of better terms, my depression feels like it has happened in two stages, simple and advanced. My simple stage, like it does for many depressed people, was a result of critical individual needs not being met. My lack of employment, my inability to find a psychiatric medication that worked for me, and my constant suicidality. I was depressed because my basic needs of employment and medicine weren't met, and once they were, I couldn't shut the fuck up about how great my new meds were because I was so happy oh my god, and I was no longer spending most of my time in bed wishing I didn't wake up when I went to sleep. Meanwhile, my advanced stage of depression feels like it's in a different category, and Disco Elysium helped me realize this with various scenes in the game that stuck with me in a way that reminded me a lot of the modern dystopia. The first scene that made this connection for me was one of Harry's dreams in which his lizard brain and limbic system are giving him a bad time about being an alcoholic. They make him conscious of how bad a shape his kidneys and liver are in, and during this moment, you get some dialogue options, one of which says, I think I need medical help. Your body makes fun of you, both for thinking medicine can fix those issues and for thinking you could access such medical care in Revachal. This scene makes me think a lot about how this is true to an extent in America. A lot of the population can't access healthcare, and I've personally known people who have had medical issues that give them a scare but still don't go to a doctor because they know they can't afford it. There are people in this country who have a bone fracture, tendon injury, or treatable cataracts that have to live their entire lives in blindness and pain. Disco Elysium captures this feeling of medical hopelessness so well not just in this scene, but also throughout the game. Folks in Revachal aren't treating their conditions with anything more complex than supplements, painkillers, and street drugs. And frankly, this isn't too different from Americans who use the first two for conditions they can't afford to get checked out, and the youth who use the third on that list because they don't have access to mental health resources. Speaking of the youth, that's another aspect in this game that reflects the modern dystopian reality. There are many young people you talk to throughout the game who are different flavors of wasted childhoods. Annette is hardworking and most likely has an anxiety disorder due to the stress of her mom's high expectations and difficult schoolwork. Kuno is the product of an abusive, addict father and has to cover up his problems with drug use and vulgarity. Cindy is an antisocial artist whose disdain for humanity is a result of the world failing her. Notice that none of these characters have their shit together. They all have problems, and they're all compensating for them in some unhealthy fashion. Kuno with drugs, Annette by chewing her nails, and Cindy with uninspired graffiti. You learn later in the game that there were attempts to fix this problem. There were community projects that tried to give kids something to do so they weren't biding their time on the streets being delinquents. But these projects failed because they were half-assed, and one character, the Dice Maker, points this out, saying that people like Kuno need a lot more than a youth program. That's true in Disco Elysium, and it's true in America. You can't expect a neighborhood basketball court and a youth program to keep kids off the streets. I know it gets really old hearing adults and teachers complain about how unruly kids are these days, but when they can't go anywhere because of car-dependent infrastructure, don't have the time or money for hobbies, and have no hope in the future because of climate change and the state of modern politics, I don't blame them for having no fucks to give anymore. 
Events like the Kai Sinat giveaway riot really shouldn't be surprising. All of these young people are only doing dumb shit out in public because they have nothing else to do. The youth are going to stay disenfranchised until we give them mental health resources so they don't need to turn to drugs, safe environments so they don't have to worry about being shot at school, and a future worth being hopeful for so they don't throw themselves in the gutter because what's the point, right? The last section of game content that really got to me is about one of the kids I didn't mention earlier, a seal. A seal is a misfit with a gang of other misfits out doing their own thing and chasing pipe dreams. You initially find her out on the sea ice with a microphone trying to record noises for an emerging experimental genre of music. When interacting with her, you can win a passive empathy check that tells you, quote, She looks at the recording device, the thing she thought would fill her hours with joy and escape. It's turning out to be an empty fantasy. She feels childish, very useless all of a sudden. This tidbit, before getting into the heavier dialogue behind an empathy white check, portrays how anhedonia, the inability to enjoy things you used to, can suddenly hit you like a truck. It's like the high of your hobby is wearing off, but there's another high that a seal is coming down from too. You realize that she isn't dressed for winter weather because she's under the influence of drugs that make her feel warmer than she really is, and that's also starting to wear off. If you pass the aforementioned empathy check, you're presented with a scenario that stuck with me more than any scene in the entire game. You pick up her contact microphone, and the narrator says, quote, The device is still warm from her touch, and heavy as a brick from the batteries inside. The company logo, Omicron, adorns its yellow plastic cover. Inside, the tape is rolling. The girl looks at the device in your hands. You then proceed to tell a seal, I'm sorry you have to sit here on the ice, feeling miserable, at your age or any age in this weather, waiting for it to get dark. The narrator then tells you that a seal looks you in the eye, her pupils wide, surrounded by a ridiculous amount of makeup. You then proceed talking, saying, The people who built this world intended for it to be better for you, but they failed. It's easier to live in their failure with this by your side, you say, referring to the microphone. It's not a childish fantasy. It can be a real weapon against what's coming for you now. Of course, this makes a seal curious, and she asks what's coming for her. There's two options here, and I just don't have the heart to pick the dark, so I usually end up picking the second one that says, Nothing if you've got this. Don't be scared. That's a lot to take in, so let's back up and examine this. A seal's high on two kinds of escapism. Escapism through substance and escapism through a hobby, experimental music. Both happen to be wearing off at the same time, making her body feel cold and her hobby feel childish. This hits me really hard for multiple reasons. Firstly, I love experimental music, and there are characters in this game that harshly judge the kids trying to make some. I, similar to a seal, don't let that biting criticism get to me. You kind of have to learn to take it in stride to enjoy experimental music in the first place. While I don't make experimental music myself, despite it being a pipe dream of mine to do field recordings someday, I'll admit that there are times where I'll be listening to music as a coping mechanism, and it just won't do anything for me. Anhedonia has robbed me of the ability to use it as a shield from the dark. Like a seal, I begin to feel disappointed that the thing that was supposed to give me hours of joy suddenly feels pointless. Music aside, the dialogue here feels like the kind of advice I would tell those who can't understand all my philosophical jargon. Obviously, I'm not going to tell the average person that capitalism has failed them, and as such, they don't need to individualize all their problems. Sometimes, it's better to be simple and let them know that the world really wishes it could be a better place for them, that it's unfortunate we have to live amidst its failures, and that it's easier to live through it by holding dearly to the things we care about most in this world. There's no point introducing the concept of time to someone who feels this lost. I don't want to tell them, you won't be suffering like this forever, or that this too shall pass, because that leads to a question I can't answer. When? It's better for those suffering in the rubble of societal failure to cling to what keeps them attached to this world. Time doesn't matter if you're good at keeping away from the darkness. All of this said, what do these morose moments in the game have to do with the aforementioned advanced depression that this video is supposed to be about? Well, advanced depression isn't about unmet basic needs or suicidality. I have what I need for survival, and I'm not suicidal. Advanced depression is instead about a deep-rooted disappointment with the world. There are some days where I wake up and I hate reality. I look at its happenings and art that remind me of its symptoms and become disappointed in the modern conditions, like a teacher who knows a student would be doing better in class if they just applied themselves. It's easy for someone to say that this is about the media I consume, that all the media that makes me feel bad should be avoided. That's helpful when it comes to the news, which I don't consume so heavily nowadays for the sake of my mental health, but telling someone to avoid art? That's nonsensical. There's a switch flipped in my mind that analyzes the themes of media, and because this media is a product of our environment, it will always be reminding me, at some range of intensity, about our modern dystopia. There's no avoiding that. Disco Elysium has a game function called Thoughts. You have to unlock and internalize them, and the latter takes time to do. This is a great way of showing how thinking really works. 
You can yell all the slogans, America's a third world country, Nordic countries make us look like a shithole, but none of that means the idea has seeped in. The soda of dystopia has only just been freshly spilled on your mind carpet. It's surface level. You could get it out if you shampooed it enough. It's when you really sit down, take some time, talk with people who are suffering from this environment, acknowledge how it irks you in your day-to-day -day life, that's when the thought seeps in. The soda is making the carpet sticky and crusty. It's not a surface-level thought anymore. You understand it with your heart just as much as your mind. Understanding a concept with both your heart and mind certainly makes it easier to write thought-provoking essays, and it's a good way to get these thoughts out so they're not stuck in my head. This might be why a lot of great thinkers and artists are plagued by substance addictions and despair. What's unfortunate is that the public that consumes their art and philosophies simply see it as an eccentricity. It makes the popular thinker more intriguing, instead of being an indication that understanding concepts which let you internalize the world's shortcomings can damage someone because they cannot escape seeing this in aspects of their everyday life. Marx saw a sense of class struggle in all aspects of society. Foucault saw a system with different flavors of imprisonment. David Graeber noticed a sense of wastefulness and lack of action. Mark Fisher felt a lack of utopian thinking barred by a capitalist realism. These are no longer just different lenses of the world via a broad ideology such as feminism or socialism, but personal lenses constructed from the synthesis of these different ideological themes to result in one example of what a good ideological synthesis looks like. This is why these thinkers are highly valued, and it's why there's a difference between reading a philosophy textbook, which lists out philosophies plainly, and reading a book about a philosopher, a person who lays out the synthesis of these philosophies as it applies to reality. I'm sure it wasn't alien to these thinkers for them to wake up and be disappointed with reality, for their day to be ruined because a piece of media they were enjoying started to remind them of the problems they prescribed to society with their philosophies. One could try to commend people like me by saying I'm doing better than the thinkers of the past, since I'm not slowly killing myself with addiction or suddenly with suicide. However, it still leaves the problem that some days I will lose my grip on the things that shield me from the existential dread seeping in. There are some days where no amount of music or writing or hobby stuff will save me from it. I'm at its whims, and it's on these days where this advanced depression, this discontent with a world that sits in the shadow of its potential, hits me like a brick.